so it's, it's especially critical. And I think, you know, this, this idea of, of moments that matter, and I, you know, I, I mean, I appreciate listening to Shred, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to repeat. I, so, but I, I think there's many components that we're also looking at, but I, I think this idea of moments that matter <clears throat> is something that, that we are continuing to focus on. And I think, you know, as, you know, as the world has opened up and we have the opportunities to, to gather, even though we are, are supporting and, and advocating and reinforcing this idea of work your way, um, it's not important where or, or, or when you work, it's, it's the output. But this idea of moments that matter. So a, a couple of things that I will, I will um, maybe touch on there. As we look at our facilities, and I think we are not the only ones, um, but certainly looking to make sure that we are, are are changing our offices such that it's delivering an important moment, you know, you know a, a, an important, um, it's delivering the space that we need for important moments that matter um, when we come together. So um, really looking um, hard and, and listening to employees and, and watching employees and, and, and understanding how, you know, how we should build those spaces such that it delivers an experience that that people get what they need when they when they come in. Um, but the the second thing that I will I will, will touch on that I think you know as as I'm hearing feedback from from our little teams and it's not it's not something that necessarily we are driving from the top. But I think some you know if if um, team members and supervisors understand this, um, you know, going back out and and um, you know, having that 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 group picnic or that 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 little excursion, um, again, bring bringing in people that that work remotely if that's you know if if if, um, if they're open to it, but but really you know creating you know taking time to create those moments that maybe in the past uh, were were something that that people didn't necessarily want to to um, attend. You know, I don't want to go to a a uh, happy hour after work every, you know, every week. But but now we, we change that and we say, okay, let's gather as a team, uh, you know, uh, once a month, and we've got to, we've got a purpose to do that, and it's to to build that energy. So I mean, I think just thinking of this this idea of moments that matter and and um, some using our creativity to come up with with new new opportunities for moments that matter can help create that team, the team spirit. Yeah, this, this is clearly a work in progress for, for our panelists as well as I'm sure most of your companies out there. Um, no one wants to come back to work after a prolonged absence to find they're expected to work differently, but the office looks exactly the same. So I'm sure many of you will co have gone back to find that there are more collaborative workplaces, fewer desks, more phone booths where that you can um, where you can have some private conversations. Frankly, um, you. If you're just going to spend all day on the phone on one-on-one -on -one calls, you may as well just stay home. But if you're going to work and collaborate, you've got to have a workspace where that is something that can be achieved, right? So um, I'll come back to you, over to you on this, Harold. So you're clearly got a philosophy um, at Big Rim which does in talk about inclusion, compassion. So how do you manifest that? You know, how do you spread that philosophy more broadly through the company? Obviously, it's from the leadership down. If the, it's the sunshine principle. If you behave a certain way, then people have a, a, a role model and that's how they know they should be thinking and, and behaving. Um, in the context of their job, but how do you inculcate that? How do you get people to, to come along with you on that journey? How do you lead them there? Well, we have to try to be clear about who we are and what we want to do. So we try to uh, communicate really well um, what we stand for. So doing business with compassion for the development of civilization and harmony with nature. That's what we have to do. And. Uh, in, in, in Big Rim, we don't use the word CSR, so I forbid the word CSR, because CSR is a, is a unnatural word that came about because people didn't do that. And so what we say is there are different activities we do, all supposed to be good for society. Some activities 
they have no income, only expense. Some activities have much less income than then they have expense, and some activities have much more income than they have expense. So altogether, makes us be a livable, uh, living organism. And we, the values we have, uh, actually, whenever I ask people in the company, everybody knows them, so they can repeat them. So we try to tell them and live them, and then, indeed, we have to walk the talk. So when you talk about, uh, actually, gender equality is not a topic in our company, because it's a natural occurrence in in our in our board of the, the public company, Big and Power. We have 50% women. We have um, many, many women that lead our organization during the history. And I think it comes through the, um, from the 144 years we have been in business. Women have always played an important role. For instance, my, my uncle was married to a nurse. She spent her whole life doing charity work and she was, uh, she got a first foreign woman that got a lady title from the king. And she took my uncle to please join all that. And my uncle was a very Rotarian at his heart, so he always wanted to create benefit for, for others. Uh, my father, my mother were also similar like that. So we are involved in many, many charitable or social causes. And many, a number of them I lead myself, a number of them I'm a member, and in many of these, the women are the leaders. So I think for Thailand, at least for Bikrim, we don't have an issue of, of women leadership. And um, maybe it is because for Thailand is easier. There's a very interesting study I recommend to everybody. Yeah, well, explain what you uh, mean by that. Yeah, so if you go to, there's a man called Hofstede. I think he made the survey for IBM. And he said there are different, different elements one can look at, at cultures. And I, I have it here. So it's a egalitarian against hierarchy, collectivist against individualist. And there's one part which is nurture important or power important, femininity uh, versus masculinity. And Thailand, fortunately, is very strong on feminine values in society. So I think a country like Thailand is easier to, to have a women inclusion, whilst Germany is much more difficult from, from such. And uh, I'd like to take up this point of uh, the Chambers of Commerce. Uh, Kun Gop Gan is a leading figure in the Thai Chamber of Commerce. I was also part of the board before. I think we can, we can do that. And in Thailand, I think it's not so difficult. I think we, we have other issues like uh, we have a lot of uh, gender change. How do you deal with that? We have a lot of people who love their own gender. How do you deal with that in the society? And I think there are other points of in uh, uh, unequalness. Uh, some people fairly, I think fairly is how you deal with it in society, huh? right? <laughs> well, if, yeah. if someone's changed their gender or they're, they're, they love the same sex, I mean, you just deal with them fairly, right? Exactly. Mm. And so. Um, and I'm, I'm the chair of the Royal Bangkok Symphony Orchestra, and there you have a lot of certain biases. So when we make audition, nobody can see them. So if you have a trumpet player, then naturally men will think a trumpet player must be a man. But when you don't see whether it's a man or a woman, you decide by the quality of their performance. So the women have a chance. So I think we have to think in many cases where there's a bias against one or the other and try to create a situation where this bias cannot come to the fore. And so I think there are many ways of doing it. I just went to visit a company in Silicon Valley called Eightfold and they, they Eightfold based on the, on the Buddhist ways to enlightenment. And they have a lot of, they use uh, artificial intelligence and um, to to have a, a deep knowledge of all the people, not only working in one company, but working in all companies they can get their hand on. And they said that artificial intelligence helps a lot against biases. You can screen off certain things, and then you can have a much better chance to get the persons you, you want. And I think this is in, if we, uh, when we work, we, 
not only have to give chance to women, or we also have to give chance to young people. We have to give chance to everybody who wants to change and want to adapt. And this great resignation maybe also comes because the younger generation, they want to prosper, they want to do this and that and that, and is, are we talking to them or are we not? So I think there are many issues, and fortunately I would say for Bikrim, we don't have a problem with gender equality. Um, well, that's, that's excellent to hear, um, but I just want to take you up on AI and um, helping uh, disperse gender bias because a lot of um, algorithms are written by men yes. and there's an in, they in, the, their bias are embedded in the algorithm. So I think eventually as AI, as, as machine learning learns, they can learn to um, eradicate it, but I think that it's, we're still a long way from, from being able to say that um, AI is gender neutral um, at this stage of the game, certainly from our, our research. But I'm really interested in, in uh, what you were talking about with, with your company, with B. Grimm. And I think one thing, we touched on it in the last session, another thing that we've found is that companies have taken on a much more maternal, paternal role in their employees' life during the pandemic. Benefits have ramped up, you know. Uh, we didn't offer any mental health counselling. We didn't offer um, parental leave, specific parental leave, perhaps for weeks, maybe for a couple of days. Um, we've increased our maternity and paternity leave to 20 paid weeks um, from 16 paid weeks. So there's been lots of change and to the benefit of employees and ultimately that's to the benefit of companies. If you have happier employees, you're going to have a better performing company. But have your company, as PwC for example, um, ramped up the benefits and have you seen the benefit from the benefits? I think we have actually, actually been on this journey for, for a number of years. I, I don't think it's just been spurred by what's happened in the course of the last two years. Uh, the, the focus around flexibility at the workspace, giving all sorts of benefits, uh, and uh, I including the point about well-being that I just made. We have been on that journey. It's sort of been pushed further along the last uh, two years, I would say. We started something called a Be Well, Work Well uh, campaign globally uh, three or four years ago where you talked about the physical well-being, the mental well-being, spiritual, social, all of that coming together, right? So you had your best if you're happy and healthy is, is the sort of thing we've, we've tried to drive. But I also would make another point. I think um, the, what, what our uh, studies have shown is that companies are able to build trust with their employees and with their stakeholders if they show that care and that uh, you know, really genuinely and authentically wanting to help their employees, right? So that's another thing that I think it's not just serving a need to retain or to be able to attract employees, it's really how well a company is trusted. And that trust agenda has become a lot more important these days, I think, in the minds of, uh, of uh, uh, CEOs. And then the other point I would, another point I would make is that uh, you know, if you look at, many of you would have come across the Edelman Trust Barometer, the survey that's done every year by Edelman. And what that has suggested is that the society's expectations of businesses has increased tremendously over the last few years. And some may argue, and uh, I'm in that camp as well, and that's largely because maybe governments have not re really been able to play that role. So it's fallen on, on the shoes of uh, business and business leaders to, to take that up. And that means there's also been a shift to thinking about the environment, thinking about climate change, thinking about uh, you know, employees, thinking about